I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. I'm delighted to welcome our guest today, Jorge Contese. He is the founding director of the Rutgers Center for Transnational Law and a professor of law at Rutgers. Thank you so much for your time today, Jorge. Thank you for the invitation. Jorge, how do you think the pandemic has impacted the international human rights landscape? Oh, in several ways, definitely. So first thing I would say is that the moment this becomes a pandemic, we should, we should remember it's because the World Health Organization declares this to be a pandemic. So uh, the WHO is one of the international, the main international organizations. So the fact that the WHO declares something first as a uh, disease of international concern and later in March of 2020, a, an actual pandemic, that, that statement has both political, of course, diplomatic, but, but it also has legal effects in the sense that countries that are members of the WHO must take action. And so that's the very first step in which it has impacted. And then of course, how uh, different countries have reacted to this, I would say on the one hand, by for example, declaring uh, states of exception. And so uh, uh, gripping power in ways that are not, not, not ordinary, not usual. That's one way in which we've seen international organizations and human rights organizations reacting to how states um, adopt certain measures. And definitely the way in which we think about, for example, health and, and health measures and how, how those social rights are enforced by, by the state and vis-a-vis -vis private actors. Or hey, the historical precedent is that a pandemic will ultimately exacerbate erosions of civil rights. In other words, an event like a pandemic is, is ultimately a, more likely to be a catalyst for inhumane outcomes than humane outcomes, even as public health conditions in some countries, if not around the world, improve. Is your assessment at this point that this pandemic is going to be a catalyst for greater human rights or really against human rights? Well, it's hard to tell. It's hard to separate what one would sort of expect, what one would, would wish happened with what's going to actually happen. But I would say, I remember very clearly in April of last year, of 2020, there was this editorial in the Financial Times talking about how the pandemic, and this is just when the pandemic had just hit, right? It's just a month or so, which it had hit at least the Western hemisphere. And, and so the Financial Times talking about the need to think about certain measures that had, have been seen and, and assessed as radical, for example, universal basic income or changes in tax policy, we're now, we're now needed, that we now needed to think about this, these subjects, these matters in a different way because of how the pandemic was and would affect right, many, many people. And so my expectation, and that's what I would hope, is that we take those concerns seriously and we think about the legal architecture that we have set up since 1945, 48, sort of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights onwards, and how that machinery of you know, human rights protections has a new meaning as we enter the 21st century with this big global crisis. As you point out, it's varied country to country in terms of prioritizing public health, but it just can't be said that only authoritarian governments were able to manage, specifically mitigate and eliminate the disease once it hit their shores. So Australia and New Zealand are a great counterpoint to China. And of course, the situation in China is not the same as Taiwan or Singapore in terms of the expression of freedom. You're also a Latin American and South American specialist and Chile is, is something I wanted to talk with you about both in terms of the impact of the pandemic and constitutional politics because in the midst of this pandemic, was a vote on reforming the constitution. And the argument of the new generation was the constitution is not protecting our economic well-being and probably our health too. Um, so now that we kind of have talked about the overall landscape, we don't know yet if the pandemic will cause more of a human rights advocacy or will you know, tear apart uh, human rights. 
we have to look at case studies. So Chile is a case study with which you are very intimately familiar. Can you tell me kind of about Chile as a case study during the pandemic? I think it's easier for me to go kind of backwards, right? Instead of saying this is how it started, like the first case in Chile uh, was reported on March 3rd, 2020. But I'm going to come to right now, April of 2021, in which we're seeing something that is that it's making global uh, headlines, right? Uh, and that's that's the fact that Chile has by far the 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 most um, kind of sophisticated vaccination process uh, going on a, a very complex and 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 an exemplary to a, a greater extent um, process of vaccination right it's it's uh, I, I was reading today we are ahead of the United States in terms of the the percentage of the population who have received at least one dose and definitely a number of them who have received both doses of the vaccine but at the same time while we're doing this, uh, there's this very significant problem is that cases are soaring in ways that no one no one expected. Or I shouldn't say this. Many people actually were saying and noting that because of the ways in which the government was somehow loosening some of the restrictions, and I think more importantly, sending a message that because of the very of the, of the great vaccination process, the pandemic was kind of over. No one said this, of course, but the message that the the way it was being uh, informed to the population sort of suggested that the worst was past, was behind us, and, and that was just not true. And so that's in terms of how the, the pandemic man management is, is, is undergoing now. At the same time, as you were mentioning, the fact that this is happening in the midst of a constitutional process that is unprecedented in this country, right? We, we've never had an opportunity to actually enact a constitution through a constituent assembly. And you have had people on your show talking about, uh, about this subject, which is by far the most important in the, in, I would say in the last decades, but certainly in the history of the constitutional history of the country, the fact that the people will have the, the, the chance to actually draft the way we're going to live in the next say 30, 40 years. Um, so, I think the pandemic is affecting this process in many, many ways. To begin with, the mass mobilizations, the protests were put on hold, of course, right? Um, but at the same time, the fact that this government was, the, the current administration had such a, um, was resisting many of the measures and kind of saying we're doing good, we're com comparing it to other countries, we are a model even for developed countries, while the people were saying, oh, we're just not sure. If we listen to the experts, that's not where we are hearing. We're hearing something quite different. And the fact that now we have this exemplary vaccination process, but at the same time, 97% of the countries on lockdown as we speak, tells you about why many countries around the world are saying, look at Chile, this is what we should not do. You, you get uh, people to get uh, vaccines, but that does not mean that the pandemic is over. That's, that's really the, the story as of today. And that parallels to a fair extent the United States insofar as the kind of incongruous pattern of mobilizing mass vaccinations and then um, behaving in a way that, that uh, seems to suggest being vaccinated, it, it makes you or your community invulnerable, um, which is not the case and also relative to the polio vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, we, we don't have a year's, we don't, we don't even have one full year um, post trial to say how efficacious or effective this is gonna be in the long haul right. with respect to the variants, with respect to the original COVID. So the, the science is to continue to be vigilant. Um, the, the condition of the United States, interestingly, maybe similar to the condition in Chile where there is a desire to, you know, be amidst the masses to, to continue to, to live lives that are, you know, not according to the science of phasing out COVID, um, but rather having these waves, these constant waves. Um, would you say that's true that, that there's sort of an, is it a more individualistic or rugged individualistic kind of a frontiersman woman attitude or, or, or what is contributing to 
what you find to be the, the high rate of infection while the high rate of, of vaccinations is also occurring? Um, that's a great question. It's really complex. I will try to, I'll, I'll do my best to, to, to give a proper response to this because there are many, many things here. First, if you think of comparing the United States and Chile, um, it's, it's hard to do that because of, of the United States having so many different responses. So you, you have the federal government's response, of course, which in the middle of this pandemic has changed, right? We went dramatically from the Trump administration kind of neglecting um, what was happening to a, a very different take on the pandemic itself. But then at the level of states, right? If you compare, I don't know, say New York state after March of 2020, with other, with Florida, for example, they're very, very different responses. Whereas in Chile, because it's not a federal, but a unitary state, the response has been really concentrated in the central government, right? And so that tells you that there's really this sort of core source of political power that manages the pandemic. That's, that, I think that's very important to keep in mind as we try to compare responses in, in different countries. To the second sort of layer of your question, which I think is the really more interesting and, and, and hard to address, that is the constituent process that we are living through now is, uh, in my view, largely a response to that individualism that was somehow embedded in the uh, constitutional architecture that Pinochet crafted in the 1980s. What I mean by this is he was very successful and smart in finding the way to kind of articulate this constitutional text and structure that would somehow um, make sure that neoliberal policies be safe, right? And that's really, in my view, what's being impunged and challenged in the past couple of, I mean, more than a couple of years, the last couple of years or year and a half has been about this massive protest, but it's been going on for a while. So we see on the one hand, for example, the debate on whether or not Congress should allow people to retrieve, to withdraw their own savings from their pension funds and people saying, this is my money. If the government is not gonna come to my rescue, it's not gonna help me with some stimulus package or anything, I have the right to use my funds. And so the discussion there, which is really a constitutional discussion is, are those funds really your funds, you as a worker, right? You're putting that money every month in your pension fund um, or not. And so I would, I think what, what's going to be interesting when we look in retrospect, it's hard to do it now that we're in the middle of everything, right? But in retrospect, it's like how much those different narratives of what a country should look like, which is really what's happening in Chile right now, will impact in how, for example, we draft new new um, guidelines, new social rights, the way we think about health, about education, about social security. You know, hearing you speak about the democracy in Chile, it, it, you know, it, it really does resonate that you are discussing public policy, right? It reminds me of the debate years ago in this country during the second term of the Bush administration on pr the privatization of social security, very right. analogous yeah. to that, yeah. right? And that was like a genuine policy dispute uh, of kind of a, a, a kind of some capitalism and then a, a more secure, compassionate policy um, that that kind of considers the long term health for everybody um, that is still capitalistic, um, but is a different framework of the of the capitalistic system. It's a it's a more secure system. But when it comes to deliberating over constitutional reform. The reason why that has been perceived in the US as a Pandora's box is because of the lack of protection for minority communities, specifically black and brown communities. And now we see in the flesh, the desire on the part of politicians and even judicial bodies to restrict and suppress the vote. And that is why I think it's such a challenge to envision the possibility of a constitutional convention, which has never really happened in earnest in the last two centuries in this country. You're in the midst of it. I mean, not you specifically, but Chile is in the midst of it. Um, and and do, do you think Chileans have the security that um, they there aren't advocates in the, in the process of rewriting the, the constitution or creating a new constitution? who would ban certain you know, voters from participating in the political process. 
uh, discriminatory or authoritarian policies that would make their way into this new document in the way that in the United States, we genuinely have to fear that because of what's happened with the integrity of the vote over the last few years and the movement of an entire political party to restrict voting rights. Right, yes. Um, I guess the significant difference is uh, it, the fact that the constitution is being written on a blank canvas, right? We call it in the Spanish, we say the hoja en blanco, right? It's like a blank slate. We're starting anew, which to some extent is true. To some extent, it's hard to, I mean, you never start anew, right? You're, we're not, we're, we're somehow rewriting our constitution. We, we are reenacting this, but it's not like we are um, neglecting and forgetting about where we come from. But the way the process is set up, the different rules, this is sort of a highly technical stuff, but I think just to put it in a simple way is that the way this process has been set up and designed, um, I think prevents those um, things from happening. It, 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 it would be really hard to have a majority, a significant majority, right? You have to have like up to two thirds so that you can actually um, make changes and, and sort of adopt new um, norms, new constitutional norms. So it would be necessary to have two thirds of authoritarian people, uh, um, delegates to come up with something like this, right? Which is exactly the opposite of what's happened with the current constitution. The way why the system, why the sort of the Pinochet system has functioned is because they were able to sort of secure those, those two thirds by different ways. That's not the case anymore. And so we're really coming into sort of a, an uncharted territory in which everything seems to be open. And to many people, I should say, that causes significant anxiety. As it should, right? I mean, but the question I, I think is, <laughs> is the social or democratic capital more advanced in Chile now than it is in the United States, such that there is not as much animated concern about what will result from these deliberations and writing process? It's, uh, when I think of comparing these two situations, we, we really have a different case in the United States, as, as you were mentioning. There's really been one political party that has, has been in power for at, at least you know, the last administration and before that. And so thinking of how they have been so successful and so determined to um, getting voters out of, you know, to, to, to uh, suppress voters from exercising their political rights, their fundamental rights, that's not really what, what's been happening right in Chile. And recently, it's been quite the opposite in which the Constitutional Convention was able to be, um, was, being, uh, was set up in ways that will uh, allow for, first, this is the first Constitutional Convention in the world which has gender parity, right? Half and half, that's, we, we, we do not know of any other case up as of now in which women uh, have had half of the seats of the convention, but also with indigenous peoples. That was a very dramatic debate in Chile. And it was successfully, I mean, fortunately, it ended up in, in, in good terms in the sense that they will have, again, reserved seats in the convention. So that tells you that we're really moving, not just away, but against the model that's been in place for the past 40 years of having sort of a white male Chilean, you know, elite, governing and ruling the country. There's also a presidential election upcoming. There's, there's presidential elections. There are um, municipalities elections. There are governor's elections. There are plenty of- how, how do you, how, how is the timing going to affect the current deliberations over the constitution with respect to the next president or the, the, the next Congress, if you will? That's one of the ways in which the pandemic has, has affected the process, right? Um, the, 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 the referendum had to be postponed, the election for the delegates will be postponed, and we do not really know what's going to happen with the presidential election. Now, I should say, if you look at uh, the debates in Chile, everyone is really concerned and talking about presidential candidates, who's going to be the next president, and that makes a lot of sense, I would say, in normal times. But now that we are moving into this new zone in which we do not know what's going to come out of it, right? Um, some people say we should adopt a parliamentary system, not a presidential system. I don't think that's going to happen, but I'm pretty sure that we won't have the same hyper-presidential system that we've had in the past 40 years. And so 
uh, spending so much energy about who's going to be the next president, I don't think it's really a smart thing to do. I mean, I understand that people do that and pundits and commentators sure. are doing this, right? But be, first, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of the new institutional architecture that's going to be in place. But at the same time, I would say the next president will really be someone who's going to be the president. It's sort of a transitional regime, right? Going from the the Pinochet regime that we're kind of abandoning now, finally, into this new era in which we'll have a new constitution. So I personally am not that concerned with what's going to happen, who's going to be the next president. I think it's more important to think of what type of political regime will the new constitution set up? And then, for example, how will the next Congress implement many of the solemn promises and principles that will be um, enshrined in the new constitution? It sounds like there's no possibility that the Pinochet era constitution would in any way be preserved. It's it's out of the picture. It's just that this is a delayed process, but it is a process by which once those delegates are appointed, um, the timing of which it will it will be dependent upon, you know, the deliberations, right? We we just don't know the, the outcome of the presidential election could could be decided before there is a new constitution, right? I mean, right. Um, so I guess I would answer that question in two ways. One, as a citizen, right, as a Chilean citizen, say that constitution is dead yeah. and has been dead for a while, meaning we are really kind of rejecting this. It was 80%, 80 to 20% the, the, the vote last year in right. October of 2020, right? So from that kind of political or, if you will, citizen's perspective, uh, yes, that's a dead, dead uh, document already. Right. Now, as a lawyer, I should say, there's still a chance that the, the Pinochet constitution survives because if the people vote against the new text, right, that's, yeah. Right, that would mean that the 1980 constitution survives. Right. And, and, and so, don't what, so this, is a, this is an exciting laboratory for, for democracy. Just, there is a social capital just as we close in these few minutes when when you think of the constitutional conventions um, that are successful they are ultimately forging consensus through compromise and um, we see that in the united states that is difficult to reconcile today now i don't think you're predicting that it, it will be impossible to reconcile i think if anything you're suggesting maybe the opposite that but what are any of the points of contention that could prevent there from being a document that is ratified? I'm not ruling that out. Yeah, I'm not ruling that out. And, and the reason why I say this is not just because that's a, a sort of a legal possibility, that's something right. that could happen, but more, um, we don't really know what's going to happen. That Meaning the pandemic has been crucial in sort of making us realize that we do not have control over the next month. We don't know. We, we do not know what's going to happen in two months from now in terms of how life will be affected by, by, by this pandemic. So what I mean by this is, first, we need to know who's going to be sitting, who are going to be the delegates in the, uh, to this co uh, constitutional convention. And once we know that, I think we'll have a better picture of what could happen in terms of the type of compromises what are the sticking points? What are the so-called third rails where they could be uh, obstruct? They could obstruct the passage and ratification. What you know beyond the delegate appointment process? I would say the way we understand sort of the new understanding of social rights that's key. How we, how we understand social rights? Should we have a government that uh, guarantees that people will have health, education, and social security? And if so. What will those guarantees look like? That's one. And that's connected to, for example, the right to property, right? There, there, there have been um, very obscure privatizations that took place at the very end of the Pinochet dictatorship. And that meant having some you know, very small minority become um, incredibly wealthy at the expense of the rest of the population. That's being challenged. And so the question will be, will the constitution be able to address that? And if so, how we just don't know now and you do, you can't predict the coalitions that will emerge um in, in in a sense you're saying with respect to the majority vote 
in order to ratify this ultimately of the of the delegates who will be appointed what is the threshold uh half a majority uh plurality two-thirds what what will be the the uh will it require a super majority or only a majority for ultimate ratification for ultimate ra for so for adopting norms, there's a super majority, two thirds. That's the highest quorum that we can have, right? That we can think of. Um, I think it's is is it's. I think it's very high. I would have been more comfortable with a sort of a third, uh, three fifths instead of uh, two thirds, but that's fine. That would require a lot of compromise, and right. that would require, I think, to think of a constitution that is rather minimal, that is rather brave. That it's not this long text that everyone is putting their, you know, their own grievances and their own claims. But in terms of uh, the coalitions, again, that will depend on who's going to be working, who's going to be sitting there as as delegates. Uh, even if I were a political scientist, which I'm not, I wouldn't be. I don't think I'd be comfortable predicting what that process will will look like but it, we we only have seconds left but you're saying a super majority for norms but for norms when there when there's a final passage and okay and it's a, for that there's a there's actually a current constitutional debate on whether or not some people are saying this is going to be basically the rules of procedure that the convention itself will have to set up right so we don't know so some people on the right are saying we should have another two-third vote at the end of the process I see what you're saying. People on the left are saying no. That's just to adopt norms. But so the, the process rule, within the process will exactly. No, I'm just saying that that that's going to be the key. I think to whether or not we're going to have a, a text that will satisfy people, and then we can have a a yes vote, and finally get rid of the Pinochet Constitution at long last. Absolutely, uh, Jorge Contese of Rutgers Law. Thank you so much for your insight today. Thanks to you. My pleasure. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.